Would you join me as we pray? Our Father, we thank you that you have been to us a faithful shepherd. And therefore, we rest in your care. We thank you that you provide for us, and out of your provision, we may give generously to support and care for the church, for those in need. Take these gifts as an expression of our joy and trust in you, and use them for the honor of Christ, for we pray in his name. Amen. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Deuteronomy today. We have no slides. Uh, we're going to do this the old-fashioned way. You're going to actually turn in your Bibles to things. Uh, whether you do it on an app or in the Bible itself, in a book itself, things made with paper, you know, that have margins and uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, this morning, uh, we'll be in Deuteronomy 8, and we're going to begin a six-week series, not in Deuteronomy 8. That's the first text. And uh, this morning, I want us to look at God's greatness and the gospel and how they intersect and shape and feed our daily lives in all their details. And today, I, I want to start with a question. What is God up to in our lives? Um, what's his long game, is how we may put it today. What's, what's he after, especially in affliction, especially in suffering and pain that he brings us into. And uh, we will be looking at Deuteronomy 8, 1 to 5, a passage I've selected because um, it's probably the passage more than any other that Rondi and I have turned to in 45 years of marriage to help us understand God's long game and how who he is and what the gospel is intersect our daily lives. And I'm going to be adding some personal testimony to the message as we go because it's been so meaningful to us. So this is a passage where God answers the question, what is he up to as we journey on as pilgrims in this world? So follow with me as I read Deuteronomy 8, 1 to 5. The whole commandment that I command you today, this is Moses speaking, you shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you, and your foot did not swell these forty years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. Would you pray with me? Father, this is your word, infallible, without error in all that you intend to say, and it is a living word, and we pray that it might not just be a word spoken long ago, but a word that speaks to us by your Spirit, to show us who you are, to show us who we are, to show us Christ, that we may leave resting and trusting and confident in you, for we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. So just a word about context, always have to have context here. These are the words Moses spoke uh, to the second generation of the children of Israel in the plains of Moab, east of the Jordan River as they were preparing to enter the land. How did we get here? Well, um, long before, five, six hundred years before, God had made a promise to make the children of Abraham into a great nation and through them to bring a Messiah into the world who would bless all nations. He told them they would go down to Egypt where they would be nurtured and kept until the time of deliverance. And they were in Egypt and came into a state of hopeless bondage. Uh, under Pharaoh, who is a serpent figure in the book of Exodus, the enemy of God's purposes, and God sent Moses, the deliverer, and by Moses and through Moses, by blood, sacrifice, and by power, he redeemed them from their slavery to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring them up to the promised land. But 
He didn't just take them due north across the Red Sea into the land. He took them by a road out to Sinai to make a covenant. He took them on a path, and on that path, he tested them. Multiple times he tested them, and they tested him. When you get to the book of Numbers, you find out that ten times they were tested, and ten times they failed. And on the tenth time, God said, it's time to go into the land, and they said, no way. We're not going. We're going back to Egypt. You hate us. You brought us out here to kill us. And God finally, at the end of his patience, said, okay, you want to die in the wilderness? You're going to die in the wilderness. And he released that first generation, all of them, to die in the wilderness. Their persistent unbelief brought them to the point of God delivering them over to their judgment. Forty years. That's a long time. And now the the second generation, having buried the entire first generation, is on the borders of the land, camped on the edge, and God is preparing them. And Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy, is addressing the second generation. And here, he's reminding them of something. Verse 1, we'll just walk through it verse by verse. He reminds them of the purpose of God and the covenant they've entered into. The whole commandment, he says, that I command you today, you shall be careful to do. See, God had made them his people by covenant at Mount Sinai, by blood, by sacrifice. He gave them laws to obey, to please him as their king, and he gave them sacrifices to offer when they sinned so that he, their God, might dwell in their midst, in the tabernacle. They are redeemed people. They have been called by God to God through redemption. But to have this God as their God meant pleasing him, and pleasing him meant obedience to his commands. That's simply what the relationship looked like. And Deuteronomy, the whole book, is a call to this second generation to obey. But 40 years has just gone by. It's been a hard, hard 40 years. Um, The wilderness of Sinai makes Hela Ben look like Maui. It's barren. And not only has it been hard, it's been tragic. They've had to bury a million plus people. I worked out the numbers once, how many many a day that was. They did a lot of memorial services, a lot of funerals. And God wants them to understand and to interpret not just what he's called them to, but what's been going on those 40 years. What are the facts? They wandered in a hard place. They buried a lot of people. God wants them to know the answer to the question, what was God up to? Not just the judgment of Israel, but what was he doing as he led them those 40 years? What was his long game? What was he after in the second generation especially? And starting in verse 4, Moses explains the long game. What is God up to? What was God after with them? And we would apply it, what is God after with us when he guides us through the entire course of our lives? What is he after? I have a friend, I I loved it that he did this. Whenever something difficult would happen to him, his question was, I wonder what the Lord is up to. He was so filled with expectation. Well, that's Moses here. He's answering the question, what is God up to? And there are three statements I'll make that are based on the text, and then we'll walk through them. First, First is God leads his beloved people on an appointed path. We'll look at that so that we experience our helplessness. We'll look at that. So that we experience and trust His all-sufficient faithfulness. What is God's long game to lead us on an appointed path as His beloved people so that we experience our helplessness and experience and trust His all-sufficient faithfulness? That's his long game. So let's just break it down. First, God leads his beloved people on an appointed path. If you have your Bible in front of you, um, notice verse 1, verse 2. You shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness. The whole way. Two, Two things I want you to see in that verse. Number one, God led them on an appointed path. 
In their case, it was very clear. <laughs> well, how do I, why do I say that? Because according to the book of Exodus and Numbers, uh, every day and every night for 40 years, the presence of God was seen. <laughs> there was a pillar. In the daytime, it was a pillar of cloud, and at night, it was a pillar of fire. It was there in the midst of the camp. And whenever and wherever that pillar took them, they followed. God led them every step of the way. Uh, Numbers 9, and I'll just quote part of it. Whenever the cloud lifted from over the tent, after that the people of Israel set out. And in the place where the cloud settled down, there the people of Israel camped. At the command of the Lord, the people set out. At the command of the Lord, they camped. Sometimes for a week, sometimes for a month, sometimes overnight. God clearly led them every step of the way through the wilderness. As they camped each night, they said, this is the place to which God has brought us. Now, the same is true for us. We don't have a pillar of cloud and fire, but we are God's beloved people. He gives us his word, he has given us his spirit, and he infallibly, providentially, walks us on the path he has determined for us. Here's how I put this. You're never in plan B. Did you hear that? People always say, well, I missed plan A. You never miss plan A in God's purposes. You're always in plan A. There is no plan B. Wherever, wherever you are today, whatever you are facing is exactly where God has purposed you to be no matter how you got there. That was true of Israel, it's true of us. Events don't just happen. And God has never caught up managing a crisis that he had nothing to do with creating. <laughs> That's called open theism. God doesn't quite know what's going to happen, but he's the best crisis manager in the cosmos. And so he kind of learns with this. What a, I, that's not a God worthy of worship. And he leads us on an appointed path, and he leads us as his beloved. He leads us as his redeemed people. He, in verse 5, a little later, Paul, or Moses says, Know that in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. Now, don't read disciplinarian master sergeant into that. Read father, son, a relationship of love. And, and I was thinking about this this week. It's so easy for us to read those words and say, see, the God of Israel is like a father and Israel is like a son. And we miss something. There was no other God in the ancient world who ever said that. No God of the pagan nations ever said, I will be to you a father and you will be to me a son. No God of the ancient world was interested in a relationship. And people who believed in the false gods had no sense of relationship. Their sense is, you know, we, we try to keep the gods happy and every so once in a while they must get ticked off because we didn't get any rain for three months, so let's go off and offer a sacrifice and settle them down and maybe then they'll be happy and they'll send us rain. Okay, we're done with that. Now we don't have to deal with them anymore. That was the pagan view of God. Israel's God says, I am like a father to a son with you. It's a relationship. You are my beloved, my son. In Deuteronomy 32, later in Deuteronomy, this is how God describes his love for his people. I love this. Moses describing what God's love is. He said, he, God, found him, Israel, in a desert land. And in the howling waste of the wilderness, he encircled him. Picture that. Surrounded him. He cared for him. He kept him as the apple of his eye, the pupil of his eye. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions. The Lord alone guided him. No foreign God was with him. That's God's love for his people. Circle, care for, kept, protect, bearing up. God, God is leading his people, his treasured possession, his beloved. Now, we now understand more fully what that meant. See, that, we as Christians would say, we now understand that if you and I are in Christ today, God set his love on you before the worlds began. He gave his own son and did not spare his own son to purchase you from sin and slavery to make you his own. And he's given his spirit to you that you might cry out to him as father. 
And all that he does for you, he does in love. We know, we know that now. But what I want you to see here is sometimes his love takes us into strange places. Because that second generation on the border of the land is thinking about all the ways. And they're thinking, you mean there? You mean that place? Because he took him into hard places, as we'll see. Maybe, maybe you're like me, and you look at your circumstances, sometimes today, sometimes another day, and you wonder, <laughs> how is this lo- the love of God? Uh, I always think of the, the old Quaker who got real honest with his prayers one day, and he looked up to the Lord, and he said, Lord, it's no wonder you don't have many friends the way, that, the way you treat the ones you've got. How is this love? Well, sometimes his love takes us into strange places. I, I was thinking this week, and Rondi and I were talking about it, the, the times when we were absolutely certain we were in the will of God, and we walked into a storm. The certainty we had that we were exactly where God had led us, and I had two battles with clinical depression. The certainty that we were where God had us, and I got cancer. The certainty that the church we were called to in the Bay Area, where that call had begun with such promise and an almost unanimous call by the church, had turned in four years into a church split, led by a friend, and the the, Split was about music styles. All the promises ground to dust. Was God leading us there? Yes, he was. As his beloved, he led us into those circumstances. But this passage reminds us, know then in your heart. Remember God's love for you as a father and a son. He leads us every step of the way, and wherever he leads us, whatever he brings us to is filtered through his love and his perfect wisdom for his children. And the question we always face is, are we going to try to figure it out, or are we going to trust the heart of God that plans the path? Is it enough that God knows what he's doing? And I know my God. Or does he have to explain himself to me? (laughs) Now, there's a purpose in God's leading. That's the next few verses. Verse 2 and 3, it's so that we may experience our helplessness. Listen, listen. Uh, Deuteronomy 8, 2 to 3, you shall remember the whole way, every step of the way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you be hungry. I wish that passage wasn't there. (laughs) But I'm so glad it is, because that's pretty realistic. That sounds like my experience. And notice there are four objectives here. God, God leads us so that he might humble us, he might test us, he might know us. To bring us to a place of need we cannot meet by ourselves. To humble us means to make poor. It's literally the word for dirt poverty. To lack resources. To test is to reveal reality. Uh, Many of you are educators, and as you know, many students tell you they know the stuff cold, and you say, well, let's test that. (laughs) Right? The test proves whether it's true or not. We need to be tested because we don't know ourselves. To know ourselves. He leads us so we know more and more clearly who we are. And he needs us, leads us into hunger. Now, I I know there's a whole religious industry based upon the idea that God only wants you to have health and prosperity and never wants you to have any needs unmet. I just don't find that anywhere in the Bible. Can, Can you see that what Moses and the rest of the Bible are saying here is part of God's leading of his beloved is to bring us to face what we really are. That's how I summarize this. And what am I really? Clueless a lot of the time, living in denial, self-sufficient, often, how is is it my wife puts it, um, 
Often in error, never in doubt. That's how she describes me over the years. Um, absolutely confident of myself. And that's all a lie. And God takes me on a path to show me what I really am, especially to pull off my fabulous self-deception. Did, did you know that Ameri 85% of Americans believe they're above average? You have to stop and think about that, right? Have you ever heard a recording of your voice? And as you listen to it, you say, who is that squeaky-voiced person? And everybody around you says, you. We don't know ourselves. And God leads us on a path that we might know what we really are as he sees us. And his method, I hate to say it, but it's true, is pain. Unsolvable problems are his means. They're the only thing that wakes us out of our self-deception. And he seeks to show us what we really are, helpless. And if you read the story of the wilderness, you will find we don't like that. How did Israel respond when God led them to hunger, when God tested them, when God led them to see who they really were, when God humbled them? They grumbled. They complained. They accused God of hating them. They made excuses. And that's the reality of our hearts. That's the reality of my heart. Without pain, I think I'm fine. With pain, I find out what I really am. C.S. Lewis says, God whispers in our pleasures and shouts in our pain. God leads his beloved people on a path so that they might discover their helplessness. <laughs> now, at this stage in the message, you're thinking, I am so glad I came today. First, there's the attempted assassination, and now this cheerful message. Well, I'm not done, and God's not done. Because that can sound dreadful, and I want to address that. Because here's how we can interpret this. It sounds to me like God is leading us, as me as his child, into a lifetime of affliction and difficulty just to show me how stupid I am. And can I say those may not be the words you say, but those are the words I've heard behind what you've said again and again. That the God you serve loves to make you feel miserable about yourself. And, and I get that. Uh, one, one, of the great, one of the great benefits of being a Calvinist is we take seriously the doctrine of sin and the total depravity of our hearts and the amazing grace of God to save people like us. One of the bad side effects is Calvinism is we spend a lot of time studying the depravity of our hearts as though God's goal is to turn us inward and try to figure out how awful we are. That's not God's goal. That's not his long game, so let's finish looking at the text. Because God tells us the long game. He humbled you and let you hunger, verse 3, and here it is, and then fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. Well, what, what is that? Humbled you and made you hungry. Why? So you could grovel in your sin? No. So you would see and know him in his infinite sufficiency. It was called manna. What is that? What is manna? Well, actually, that's what it means. What is that? What is it? Because here's what happened. God took Israel in the wilderness, in a barren desert, to a place where there were no resources. None. <coughs> Hundreds of thousands of people and not a plant in sight. That's called hunger. That's called helpless beyond their ability to meet their own needs. There was no same-day delivery Amazon Prime because there was no supply chain. They could not imagine anything but death. They say that. You brought us out here to kill us because that was the obvious conclusion, right? There's no food. It's miles and miles to get a little bit of food there are hundreds of thousands of us, and we're all going to die. Obvious, right? No, not so obvious. Because here's what God does. He says, I'm going to feed you every day. It's 
like a saltine cracker on the ground. They wake up in the morning and there it is and they gather it and everybody has enough and they go to bed with full tummies and some of them say, oh, I, I gotta keep this for tomorrow in case we run out and they wake up in the morning and all they kept is maggots, it's rotted. The next day they have to go out and get more and they have to go out to get more the next day. And the only exception, the only time they can keep it is before the Sabbath, they get enough on Friday for two days and Saturday they go out and they don't need to go out because God supplied for two days. And every day they go out and they see this stuff in the ground and they say, manna, what is it? No one had ever seen it before. No one's ever seen it since. All they needed every day, apparently all the vitamins, all the nutrition, all the fiber, everything in a saltine-like layer on the surface of the ground, enough for them every day. They boiled it, baked it, roasted it, pan fried it. I don't know what they did. They cooked it every way they could, but every day they had all they needed for life in the manna. Now, what's the point? God doesn't need Amazon Prime. God doesn't need grocery stores. God doesn't need wells. God doesn't need water supplies. God doesn't need plumbing. God doesn't need agriculture. God doesn't need cows. God doesn't need sheep. He doesn't need pigs. He doesn't need any of that. He can, at the word of command, supply all your needs because he is infinitely sufficient. Amen. That's it. He can even stay the laws of friction. He says, your clothing did not wear out and your foot did not swell these 40 years. You imagine wearing the same clothes for 40 years, same sandals, same whatever they wore, togas, I don't know what they wore. Didn't wear out. That's an act of God, a very quiet act of God. God led them into desperate need to show them that they were helpless, not to make them grovel, oh, we're such terrible people, but to show them that they could taste and see his all-sufficient faithfulness day after day for 40 years. God wants them and wants us to know and experience the fact that he alone is sufficient. He is our security, he is our happiness, he is our safety, he is our health, he is our daily provider. <coughs> he wants us to know this personally, not theoretically. Then he wants to pass it on the theological exam. He wants us to say, this I know is true. Here's how I would put this. Elon Musk, with his billions, is no more financially secure than Israel in the wilderness. None. With only God's promise of provision one day at a time, they were as secure as the wealthiest man alive. That's what God wanted them to see. Why? That you might, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. He wants you to trust his all faithful, all sufficient word of promise to you as his beloved child purchased through his son. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. You have to think about this. He who has God in all things has no more than he who has God only. He who has God in all things has no more than he who has God alone. That's what God wanted. Not for them to grovel, but for them to go, oh, this is the one I need. This is the greatness of my God. Rondi and I have a phrase, God doesn't want us, sometimes what God offers us is not something to do to fix the problem, but someone to trust. Because I can't fix the problem. God leads his beloved people on an appointed path that we may experience our helplessness so that we may experience and trust his all-sufficient faithfulness. God is not a teacher wanting to fill us with information. We're not learning doctrine. He is the lover of our souls, pursuing relationship. The purpose of his infinite goodness is to bring us to know him and experience. This is life eternal that we may know you, the only true God in Jesus whom you have sent to show us himself and to show us his glory. That's what he made us for. And that's the long game. I will be your God, you will be my people. 
He wants to empty our hands that he may fill them with his riches, the riches of himself. He wants to take away all our false securities that we might rest in his faithfulness and find it more than enough. If you're like me when you hear these things for the first time, maybe you're, you're, my guess is that's probably not what you were told when you signed on as a Christian. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but a lot of people are not. They, you know, if you ask Jesus to be your Savior, forgives your sin and gives you an abundant life, but nobody tells you this is the footnote on the abundant life. It's a fine print. Here's what you need to know. The living God sought you, sought me, paid for our sins in Jesus, found us, brought us to himself, that we might know him, that he might give himself and show himself to us and take us to himself in the deepest and most intimate of relationships. So here's my question. Do you and I expect a relationship with the God of glory to be like hanging out at a pool? No. <laughs> um, uh, one of the ways we have described faith the last few years is you need to invite Jesus into your heart. And I, I love the way Tim Keller put it. Letting Jesus into your heart is not like letting the cat in. You open the door and the Lion of Judah is there. And when he enters, he's kind of disruptive because that is who he is. He disrupts our self-importance. He upends our desire to be the lords of our own lives. He's, he's dealing with what we are in Adam, by self people. I, we're all two-year-olds at heart. I don't need help, by self. God's saying, no, no, that, that won't do. That's not how I made you. That's not who you are. That's not what I have for you. So again and again, beginning in conversion, when he shows us we cannot save ourselves, he disrupts our lives, leads us on a path that again and again says to us, I'm sorry, by self doesn't work. But I have something better. I have me to give to you. So I mentioned how Rondi and I have experienced God's leading us to callings, <laughs> to a calling in a church that moved from promise to a four-year battle over music styles and a church split and unemployment. I didn't mention that the next calling we had to a church was with a promise of great future blessing and peace and unity, only to turn to nine years of strife among leaders a battle with the city over land use, a battle that bankrupted the church. And that strife for nine years finally reached fruition in a full-bore church fight and church split. Second time. So here's my response as the Lord, my faithful God, led me to this point of desperation. I lived in regret. I lived in anger. I was bitter. I decided I would never be a pastor again. I told Ronnie we were going to go sit on the back row of a mega church and never again trust anyone. Now, I was the grumbling Israelite in the wilderness. <laughs> God brought me to a place of total helplessness. I grumbled and complained and blamed God, but God, but God had manna for me. In the face of my bitterness, God provided me with manna. The first was my beloved wife who <laughs> refused to join me in my bitterness. She stood between me and a choice of bitterness, and she stood with me as one flesh as we walked together. She never turned on me. She stood with me and walked with me through the darkness. Within 24 hours of when the church imploded, I had a phone call that I had nothing to do with offering me work that would take up all my time because a unoccupied mark is not a good thing. <laughs> um, someone on the board of our local YMCA called up and their opening line is, I know you're really busy, but would you be interested in being chairman of the board of our YMCA? 
And I said, funny, you should think I'm busy. I've got nothing to do. I didn't initiate that. God initiated that. We found a church, landed in a church, and unknown to us, known to God, unknown to us at the time, it was a church that for 30 years had been given God's grace to rebuild the lives of broken-hearted people. Of all the churches I could have ended up in the PCA in San Diego, this was the one in whom God worked to rebuild broken lives. And they went about doing that. God sent man of friends. There were friends who wouldn't let go of me. They provided a place of safety and care and patient listening and perspective. And in that context, God met me in Scripture day after day in the early, early hours of the morning, and he fed me with the manna of his word. Uh, I read through the book of Psalms once a month for months. I poured out my heart to God, and in those early morning hours, he circled me with his glory and fed me and broke my hardened and bitter heart and took me into his majestic love. He had to, I always say that um, I'm particularly tough stuff to work with, so God had to go to extreme measures to get my attention. Um, But were it not for God loving me enough to break me, I would never have tasted the depths of his beauty and love and faithfulness, which I will not trade for anything. He emptied my hands so that he could fill them with himself. He sent manna and people and friends and a church. And filling them with himself was worth more than all the world and still is. That's God's long game to lead us on a path to show us our helplessness so that he might fill us with his sufficiency and show us his sufficiency. Now, I tell that story by way of testimony, not because I think we're unusual or I'm unusual, but because I think I'm not. The details may change, but I know enough of your stories, and I've been a pastor long enough to know that If you've been walking with Christ any length of time, he has led you into times of desperation. Maybe in your marriage, maybe with your health, maybe with employment. Because that's his long game. It's the normal experience of his people, not because he likes to make us miserable, but because He wants us to see how great he is, and the only way he can get our attention is by bringing us to desperation. God's goal is not your misery, friend. It's not for you to look inward and keep trying to figure out how great a sinner you are. His goal is for you to see his mercy and his goodness and Christ and his greatness. And let that fill your vision the taste of his faithfulness and all sufficiency and rest in him. Um, The psalmist in Psalm 73 was at a crisis in his life. He couldn't figure out how God allowed the wicked to prosper. He was ready to abandon the faith. If you read it carefully, that's what he says. And then he goes before his God and lays out his case and he understands the greatness of God and here's where he ends. I, I don't understand how... The wicked triumph and the righteous suffer, but here's what I know, says the psalmist. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. I don't have answers, but I have my God. And that is enough. Another verse Rodney and I have turned to over the last few years is found in Isaiah. It's actually the verse that... uh, We probably go to now as much as Deuteronomy 8. In Isaiah 50, God is speaking to his people. 
He has brought them into a time of darkness. And this is what he says, let him who walks in darkness, and you can fill in all that that means, despair, hopelessness, desperation, end of your rope. Let him who walks in darkness and has no light, what do you do? Trust in the name of the Lord and rely on your God. That's it. That we can help each other with. One of our kids called us a number of years ago in a very difficult situation. And I remember that verse is what we gave them. They said, what do we do, Dad? What do we do? What do we do? And I said, nothing. Nothing you do is going to fix the problem. But you can join hands with your spouse as one and walk trusting God in the darkness until he brings light. That's it. Because that's enough. That's enough. God's purpose, friends, for you as his beloved people is to lead you on a path so you discover how empty you are so that you might find in him all the riches and glory and sufficiency you could ever imagine, all the beauty and joy and love you could ever desire. And that's enough. Would you pray with me? My Father, we thank you that your love for us is so great, um, that you don't give us what we want, you give us what we need. And you take no pleasure in making us miserable. You take pleasure in bringing us to the point of seeing your glory and beauty and love for us. So I pray, Lord, that that would be a course you would turn us to if we're not there today. Married couples, individuals, people in duress, that they would lift up empty hands that you might fill them and trust you even in the dark. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask the uh, brothers who are helping with the Lord's Supper.